Hello, welcome to my revisit series. I've recently updated my whole testing methodology for noise testing, and so I'm revisiting a bunch of old fans. Today we're going to be re-looking at the Silent Wings 4 Pro. So first, a little bit of explanation of what has changed between the two. I do have a little short on my channel as to uh, the new testing methodology, but in the end, the original testing analysis isn't completely invalid. valid. It just wasn't testing specifically what I wanted. It's test, I placed the microphone really close to the fan, where I was actually getting interference between the fan and the microphone, or extra wind noise from the air rushing past of it. It could be either or, but either way, it is a closer analysis to having a mesh filter directly over top of the fan, or a uh, radiator directly pushed against the fan. So the reason behind the previous testing analysis is that I am testing in just my home office, which is usually louder than 30, 30 uh, decibels in noise. So I figured putting the fan, microphone close to the fan, I would just cancel out the noise so I didn't have to care about as much room environment. All this led to having an accuracy of plus or minus four decibels. So that is an eight decibel range, or at least that's what I'm predicting it to be. Um, going forward, I am using a fixed distance. I actually have a pole that I'm measuring out um, the microphone from the fan, and I'm making sure that the room is at a consistent noise decibel of a two decibel range, plus or minus, to give me an overall accuracy of plus or minus two decibels or a full four decibel range. Unfortunately, this is the level of accuracy I'm only able to generate right now with my current test set up and all the details. In order to get myself to the next level, I do need help from viewers like you, channel support, Patreon, whatever, something like that, uh, to build myself a little noise chamber, a better microphone dedicated for noise testing, a more accurate anemometer, something to the closer to the accuracy of 0.01 meter per second would be what I'd be aiming for a dedicated test system, and a, a bunch of other little knickknacks all in all. Uh, realistically, I'm going to tell you, it's like $2,000, which is a little bit out of what I can just throw at this channel right now. But that's where I'd like to go. I'll keep doing testing the way I've been doing it uh, until I'm able to get to that point, in which case I'll go back through all the fans I've tested previously and, uh, well, upgrade all the data. And so the first part of this video is going to be just the data points between the new and the old testing analysis. So if you're new to this channel, I do recommend that you watch the second part where I go into each of the graphs and the data and the charts and explain all the finer details that are missing from this. But if you're returning, this will give you just a brief overview of what was then versus what is now. So in each column, we have the fan ranking as it was in the previous analysis, the model number, the RPM, and the um, airspeed I was able to generate and there's going to be noise normalized and 100% PDW fan signaling for each of the graphs. The 100% is going to have one extra column, and that is the noise. All right, let's get into each. First up is through the CPU air cooler noise normalized. Testing the Salings 4 Pro was originally ranked 14th. It is now ranked 22nd, so a pretty dramatic loss in position there. At 100% PDW fan signaling, the Salings 4 Pro was ranked 6th and retains that position value proposition was ranked 29th, it is now ranked 38th, so a pretty significant drop in position there. At 100% PW fan signaling, value proposition, it was ranked 28th and retains that position. Uh, CFM testing, noise normalized, it was ranked 15th, it is now ranked 25th. 100% uh, PW fan signaling, CFM testing, it was ranked 6th and retains that position. CFM value proposition, noise normalized, it was ranked at 36, it is now ranked at 41st, so a pretty significant drop in position there. CFM testing, 100% PDW fan signaling, it was ranked 28th and retains that position. Case simulation test, noise normalized, 6 inch mark, it was ranked at 12th, it is now ranked at 17th, so a little bit of loss in position there. At the 11 inch mark, noise normalized, case simulation test, it was ranked 12th, it is now ranked 19th, so again a loss in position. Value proposition, case simulation test, 6 inch mark, it was ranked 34th, it is now ranked 35th, a little bit of loss there. Valley Proposition, 11 inch mark, noise normalized, it was ranked 25th, it is now ranked 26th. Let's move on to the specific graphs. Now we're on to the specific graphs. First up is the case simulation test. It can be looked at a couple of key ways, but the most important for you, the buyer, is what size case do you actually plan on buying. The 6 inch mark is representative of small form factor cases that are still large enough for an air cooler with a front to back airflow type flow pattern. Not the cooler, not the case design that sucks in air from the sides and then tries to get it out the top or the bottom or sucks in from the bottom and blows it out the top. Those ones are more like a pressure scenario, meaning the cases, those cases you want fans that are good at high pressure scenarios. The 6 inch mark is also representative of a short throw distance, meaning if you're going to put fans in the bottom of your case to blow towards your GPU, that would be representative of that 6 inch mark. The 9 inch mark is representative 
of a small or a compact tower. Something like the Dell Optiplex, honestly, you're looking at a case that basically would just fit, barely fit, a standard ATX or MATX motherboard in terms of length with just room for the fan. So you'd be looking at a short graphics card for something like that case. Then you've got the 11 inch mark. The 11 inch mark is representative of a compact tower, something like the Corsair 500 series, so the mid towers, or the Meshify 2C, something along those lines. And then you have the 14.5 inch mark. This is representative of a full tower case. So basically the biggest, the baddest that you can buy on the market. And what you want for case fans is, this is most specific for air coolers, is you want the max amount of air speed hitting the cooling fan, and we're going to get into that in a second. But basically, you want these fans to be as efficient as possible, which means you want the line to be as flat as possible and as linear as possible. You don't want it to drop off very steeply at the beginning and then kind of level out at zero meters per second, because then it has no air speed across a bigger case. But it does is dependent on what size case you plan on buying as to what matters the most. Now, what I was referring to before with airspeed entering the fan. So let's say you've got your heatsink or radiator over here. Let's say radiator or heatsink for your air cooler. Well, when a fan works, it works by sucking air in, so it's pulling a minor vacuum in front of it to then accelerate air at the front or the back of it. So if you have a fan over here and you're blowing air at the cooling fan, you're basically pushing air into where the cooling fan is creating its vacuum, thus eliminating or re greatly reducing the vacuum because it's supplying it more air, allowing your heat sink fan to operate more efficiently, which is why you see variances in different case designs or fan models as to how effectively they are cooling your like CPU temperatures. Now, uh, if you're running a radiator, AIO, or something like that, it doesn't quite matter as much, but the quality of the fan that you do use does matter. But the uh, air temperature inside your case, meaning for uh, non-heat generating components, so your motherboard, stuff like that, is going to vary relatively little. But if you're air water cooling your CPU and air cooling your GPU, you still want significant airflow going through your case so that your GPU has plenty of fresh air to inhale to keep it running as cool as possible. This was where flow patterns matter. So in a pull configuration, so the fan is on the back of your heat sink or radiator, the flow pattern coming out of the fan will be near and identical to it in an open air environment. If the fan is in a push configuration, so it's pushing air through the radiator, the radiator will actually strain out the airflow and making it improved in terms of how the air travels through the case, keeping it in a more compact uh, manner in general. But my personal opinion is you want the best concentrated airflow possible, so you might as well just get all concentrating airflows. Now, lace airflow testing be done at each of the different markers for a given amount of time for the blade to reach steady state at the fan at the end. Now let's jump on to how this fan compares against others, or my control I should say. My control fan, this teal line, is three parts A12 x 5 to one part A14. Both Noctua fans, 140mm class fans, tend to do better at the 11 and 14 and 5 inch mark while smaller 120mm class fans tend to do better at the 6 and 9 inch mark. So by combining the two, I tried to get something that was the best of both worlds to get what I just consider to be an overall good fan, to be sort of the baseline for what we want fans to outperform or at least closely match. So we see that the Silent 4 Pro is underperforming compared to my control fan. How about at 100% PWM fan signaling? Well, this is where the RPM matters. My control fan would be based around around 2000 RPM, while the Silent 4 Pro uh, does spin at essentially 3000 RPM, so it just dominates the graph. But amazingly, its airflow is not particularly efficient because of how close its airspeed is relative to the control fan at 14.5 inches. Now, how does it compare against other fans? Well, on here, this yellow line is the Wonder Snail. The Wonder Snail is what I consider the bottom end of the good fans. And the reason for that is at the 14.5 inch mark, it is right smack dab in the middle of what I consider to be the good fans, this upper top grouping. So it is a very efficient airflow in terms of flow design, creating a concentrated airflow pattern. The problem is it doesn't have as high a uh, initial burst speed. So it's ranked where it is for a reason. And then you have lower performing ones like the white light wings right here and the um, S12B is what I consider towards the bottom end. So the Silent Wings 4 Pro sits right here towards the bottom of the good fans and then it drops 
right towards the bottom and stays at the bottom of the good fans. So you can't win them all. How about at 100% Peter and Fencing Link? Well, here it does really well at the 6, 9, and then 11 inch marks. It's barely hanging on to its second place position, but it drops off much more steadily. But RPM matters, and it's spinning at fairly fast RPM, but it's also producing a pretty significant amount of noise. Next, the 9 inch mark. The 9 inch mark for noise testing is there because a lot of fans tend to drop off in airspeed fairly rapidly between the 6 and the 9 inch mark, and I need an airspeed over 0.5 meters per second in order to get accurate readings, so the 9-inch mark was chosen. The Silent Wings 4 Pro is sitting right here, kind of in the middle-ish. It has a efficiency curve right here where it lines up much more closely, and then it's well behind the other fans. Let's move on to... Dropping to 40. Silent Wings 4 Pro at 100% and then 50% PWM and fan signal. 100%. Fifty percent. One hundred percent. Fifty percent. Next, we're doing airspeed to the CPU air cooler. My cooler is the Noctua U12A. On the left side here, we have RPM versus airspeed. This is basically a blade efficiency graph. It is how efficient is this fan design at pushing air through the heatsink or a radiator of similar design. While the right graph is noise versus airspeed, this is how much noise does it generate for that level of performance. Well, right away, if we take a look at the left side, we can see that the Silent 4 Pro is slightly outperforming my control fan, indicating that it is a very good blade design for moving air. If we take a look at the right side, we see that it is a little bit less noise efficient, except for as we start hitting higher RPMs, higher air speeds, it does start to gain a little bit of efficiency, then drops back a little bit, bounces around overall quite a bit. I did take extra data points with this fan, meaning every five uh, PWM fan signal, 5% PWM fan signal, while most other fans I took it at every uh, 10%. So now how does it compare against other fans? So first, a little bit of explanation on here. This key on the right side is a wattage, so 225 watts equals 2 meters per second. I did a whole series of tests on my CPU or cooler, letting it reach thermal max, uh, letting it stabilize the wattage for the airspeed going through it, taking measurement of the airspeed, and I was able to equate a wattage to an airspeed, and I backed off the PWM fan signal and repeated that process of stabilizing the wattage and taking in the airspeed, so I was able to equate a wide variety of wattages for a wide variety of air speeds traveling through it. Now, how does this data, how is this data applicable to you? Well, it's most applicable to the U12A and my CPU, the i7-11700K, so if you don't have uh, the same setup as me, it's not going to be directly applicable, but the trends are still always going to hold true. So let's say you have the NFF12 and it's on your CPU cooler, whether that's a radiator, AIO, or a heatsink. Well, it's moving 0.5 meters per second there for my noise normalized value of 12 decibels. If you upgrade to the P12, it's going to be pushing 1.3 meters per second there for that same noise value. So if your CPU is unlocked, it means you're going to be able to draw a higher wattage for that same noise level. If your CPU is locked, or non-K, or if you limited the um, clock speed on it, you're going to run your system cooler, or you can take this extra overhead, this extra air speed, back off the PWM fan signal, and now your system will run quieter. So what does that mean for the Silent 4 Pro? Well, it's pretty much in the middle of the pack. It's certainly a good place for it to be uh, around other well-performing fans, but there are other significantly cheaper ones, like the TLG-12, 
that are right at this noise normalized value, and it's of course a far cry away from the A12X25. How are things looking at 100% PW fan signal? Well, here it's actually doing really quite well, but the, here in this test, RPM does matter, and it's the bottom end of the 3000 RPM fans. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. But mind, it is on the quieter side compared to other 3000 RPM fans, so again, you have, need to take that into consideration. So it moves quite a, a bit of air, not too bad noisy, but it is noisier, so you have to weigh what is most important to you. So next is uh, cooler air speed versus decibel rating, and we see the Silence 4 Pro is sitting right here towards the bottom end of what are the good fans, and the good fans are the ones listed on here, with just the Silence 4 Pro being highlighted. But all the ones on here I would consider to be relatively good. Let's move on to the next section. Now we're on to CFM testing. So CFM testing is a very scientific test, and it should only be used in a scientific way. Uh, a lot of other reviewers use it as a simulation of how good this fan is through a case airflow. That is fundamentally incorrect, and they clearly know nothing about aerodynamics. Uh, allow me to explain. So first, CFM. How is it calculated? We have a tube. In my case, my tube is circular, but it can be any shape. You just need to be able to calculate the surface area. So again, mine is a tube, so pi r squared gives you the surface area. Let's put r in feet. Next, you have the fan. It's the same size as the tube. It's blowing air down it. You're going to have the air speed. That's going to be in feet per minute. So feet per minute times feet squared is feet cubed per minute, so cubic feet per minute. And the reason this test is invalid for using as a case, as a, how good this fan is in case airflow, is because you're putting the fan in a tube, the fan is the same size as the tube, so there's no room for the air to spread out. So if the fan is really bad at concentrating airflow, the air only has one place to go, and that's down the tube. But there will be a tendency for fans that do focus the air to outperform fans that tend to shoot air off to the sides. That does hold true, but the problem is the differentiation. So how uh, different the fan uh, air speeds look, or CFM looks, they're going to look much closer in performance than they actually are, which is why that case simulation test is actually like gold. And as far as I can tell at this point, no other reviewer is doing that. So that leads me to where is CFM testing, so this sort of down a wind tunnel, uh, actually valid? and like I just said, wind tunnel testing, that is exactly one of the purposes of it. You could also generate PQ curves. So you need a couple pressure sensors, you need to take the airspeed, maybe dynamic pressure. If you want me to do a video on calculating this, I, I can. I would bring out my uh, engineering textbooks. I am an aerospace engineer. This is a, I have a, my, my specialty in uh, grad school was actually in computational fluid dynamics. So this is an area that I know quite a bit about. But anyways, um, you could use it for generating those PQ curves, so that's pressure versus air speed. And you would need a slit or a variable valve to, to get a done bunch of different pressure readings in there. And you'd be able to know how good a fan is at a bunch of different pressure scenarios. So, again, it's scientific. It gathers data. It gives you a lot of really useful information for how good a fan is at different types of heat sinks. But not in a case airflow environment, so open air environment. It tells you nothing about that piece of information. So you just need to be able to use it in the right way, and I'm unimpressed by a lot of other fan reviewers using it. Now, they're testing for CPU cooling. That is pretty easy. Honestly, you put the fan up a cooler, you measure temperatures, bing, bada, boom, done, as long as you keep your testing consistent. It's um, very easy. So this leads me to case and points. So on these graphs, I'm going to go through fairly quickly. Better fans top left, worse fans bottom right. And we see the Silence 4 Pro lines up near on perfectly with my control fan. It's honestly a little bit different than we saw through the CPU or cooler, indicating just how like invalid this test is, that all the fans tend to unify under one line. Where you start to see differences is in noise versus CFM, where we see the offsets like we saw previously. Let's keep moving along quickly. So we have the Silence 4 Pro sitting right there towards the bottom middle. Other graphs in noise normalized testing, CFM. And at 100%, it's right up towards the top, right at the bottom end of the 3000 RPM fans. All the fans underneath it are around 2100, 2200. Actually, that one's 2300, but anyways, well below 3000 RPM. So that's, uh, let's uh, move on to the next section. Next up, we have CFM versus decibel reading. I uh, completely forgot about this, and it's right here. It's sitting towards the bottom end of the 
quote unquote good fans, which are the ones, other fans that I've listed here, or at least ones that I feel that are uh, good performers and are worthy of being listed in a graph. Well, I'm gonna do a quick open box experience. I did do this in my original video, so I'm gonna ask that you reference that for full details. But in the box, you get this box that holds the fan, and then you get an accessory kit. And in the accessory kit, you get some other types of adapters. So um, this one is like an airflow adapter, and this one is like a direct attach type thing. Um, I personally wouldn't even switch away from the pressure frame because the pressure frame is going to work as case airflow is going to work on your radiators, while these two frames are basically only single purpose for, um, well, the case. So it's it's kind of like needless waste by uh, Be Quiet here to include those adapters unless they somehow reduce extra vibrations going into the frame that this one doesn't, which is outside the scope of my measuring capability at this time. So I would just leave it on, on the pressure frame. Uh, as far as a blade analysis on this fan, well, here's the Be Quiet next to its probably biggest competitor, the Noctua A12X25. Mind the Be Quiet is able to achieve a much higher RPM of 3000 while the Noctua tops out around 2100. So they are different categories. So this one you could almost compare against maybe like the T30 or other 3000 RPM fans. But in terms of blade design and well thickness, the T30 is 30 millimeters thick while this is only 25. It's realistically design competitor is the A12 right here. And it's pretty clear that the Be Quiet has fatter fins. So fatter fins in general are better for pressure optimization than uh, thinner ones. And then you have the amount of overlap. So that's where the one blade uh, begins and the other one ends. How much do the blades overlap? Also for pressure type applications. The second criteria is what is the distance between the blades? So the bigger the gap between them, the more air that it can suck in, the better it is for airflow. So it's pretty clear that Be Quiet did optimize this for both pressure and airflow with fatter fins, but leaving a actually wider spacing here than what looks like Nocto has left. There's more room for my finger basically to slide in there. I'm well aware that my finger thickness is not particularly scientific. I just don't have that kind of measuring device again yet. I'm hoping to acquire one through the help of my supporters, meaning viewers like you or uh, getting a channel sponsor. So we're gonna stick with unscientific ways for that. So what does that mean? So Nocto has gone for thinner blades at a tighter, tighter spacing to get th the pressure performance here, while Be Quiet has gone for fatter blades with more overlap, but a larger spacing to get sort of a similar type result. Noctua has these little ridges here at the end that they're famous for that help guide the air along the blades. So the majority of the fan's thrust actually comes from the tip area because the inside is technically spinning slower, so it's moving less air in there than the outer part. Be Quiet has the same sort of thing. It has a similar size hub. So having the fans with as little gap to the edge improves performance drastically as opposed to one that has a bit more space between the edge of the frame and the edge of the blade but there is a downside to getting that up close. If the materials inside the blade are too soft or essentially weak, the, they stretch over time. So a lot of really less expensive fan blades, they leave extra gap in there. So as the, flame, as the blades in the fan blade uh, stretch over time, they won't hit the frame. But there's a consequence to basically using higher quality materials and that's extra cost in the fan meaning you, you now have more expensive fan to reach the higher quality uh, and achieve those higher performance levels. Uh, you also want it as close as possible because that improves the efficiency and also doesn't leave any room for air to recirculate back out. So anywhere that there's a lower pressure, so if there's not optimized at the inside, not optimized at the edge of the frame, air can actually circulate back out of the fan blade coming essentially towards, towards the camera here. So if they're not really close, air can come back out this way or come back out on the inside. And that does kind of ruin your pressure optimization. And this is specific towards like high density radiators uh, for your liquid cooling type loops that that would be applicable to. 
Unfortunately, I can't really test the inside, but I can say that getting the, the blades as close to the edge as possible does improve that level of performance. And it's pretty clear that Be Quiet, uh, well, they're not quite as tight as we see on uh, Noctua's, but they are very close. I would say that they are part of the, like, a newer crop of fans that are getting much closer than they used to be. So if Noctua is like an A+, be Quiet would be an A in this category. Um, and I've seen other fans that are more like Cs. <laughs> so average. <laughs> be Quiet's also famous for these ridges on the fan blades. And they have two effects. They help also guide the airflow. So you don't want the air to run off the edges of it. The, we already talked about the shape, but it has a controller in the back. So you can set a medium high speed or ultra high speed. I would just leave it at ultra high speed and then set it at a lower PWM signal if you're happy with that. Just know that it has a lower minimum RPM. Did I say lower minimum RPM? Higher minimum RPM. So to get this off, you have to push in on these two tabs. So it slides, locks in place. It's not the easiest thing to do in the world with uh, one hand, but you would push in on them and then you would have to slide it off. So it's really easier with just two hands. But other things just about this frame, it's, it's doing quite well. I'm pretty, like I said previously in my uh, original video, I'm very happy with this fan. I think it's an excellent all-around performer. The one area it's bad at is in a pull configuration on a heatsink. It just causes a lot of air turbulence against um, the, the fin stack. So I would be hesitant to use this in a pull configuration. You would have to do your own testing on a radiator uh, in an AIO or in custom liquid cool loops. I just don't have that one of those to really test against right now. But in terms of on a heatsink, this is a no-go in a pull configuration. I did a whole testing methodology on it. I'll have that video linked below. And it was just incredibly noisy, like ear-pitchingly horrible. Let's uh, jump to the next section now. Now we're on to value proposition. The Sidewings 4 Pro 120 is a $32 fan based on a standard retail pricing that I could find. So if it goes on sale or prices change, just note that the value proposition does go up. It's really simple to calculate. It's just the air speed at a given value divided by money cost. Um, you can convert it to whatever units you want, in meaning uh, pounds, dollars, uh, Canadian, Canadian dollars, whatever. Uh, value proposition is particularly pr important if you're on a tight budget. So if you're on a tight budget and trying to squeeze every penny out of your build, you want to pay special attention to these graphs because this is how you get the best bang for your buck, which is the most important to you. But if you've got a little bit extra wiggle room in your budget for better noise performance, better maximum performance, a certain aesthetic, RGB, whatever the criteria may be, that's when you can weigh this with the earlier graphs or whatever you're looking for and determine which fan best suits your particular needs. On all these graphs, the right left side is going to be noise normalized and the left side is going to be 100% PWM fan signaling. So first up is the six inch distance noise normalized or uh, noise, noise normalized and 100% PWM fan signaling. And we do see that the Sidewings 4 Pro is sort of at the bottom middle of the graphs. It's actually a worse value than the A12X25 at noise normalized values at 100% PWM fan signaling. It is doing a little bit better, but I would still call it under the average. So it's definitely not a cost-effective fan. At the 11-inch mark, it is once again below the average line in both the 100% and noise-normalized values. How about uh, through the CPU or cooler? Well, once again, it is sitting below the average mark, I'd say overall, so it's in the lower part of the graphs, but it isn't a terrible choice. There are just many fans that are much better value, even though it does have a very good top end overall. And at 100% PWM fan signaling, it's just barely above average, I would say, overall, looking at it. And uh, CFM testing, it is basically sitting right in line. So where do I think... This brings me to what do I think of the Centerlinks 4 Pro. Well, I think it's a very good-looking fan. It definitely performs really well. Just the noise performance isn't, isn't really there. Uh, Be Quiet needs to work on that a little bit more. Um, and its price. I would honestly just sell this fan with just that box frame and ignore everything else about it. Save, I don't know, five bucks, maybe less than that. Even three bucks would raise its value proposition quite a bit uh, because it's proportionally a fairly large amount. So that's what I would think that uh, Be Quiet would should do to this fan to make it a bit more cost-effective overall. Let's go to my 
wrap-up section. And at the end of every video, I like to show off my raw data. This data does belong to me. I am the one who generated it. And I, quote unquote, own the rights to it. But if you want to use this data for your own particular purposes, meaning if you would like to put it into your own Excel chart to then be able to have these numbers at hand for whenever you want, you are more than welcome to do so. Or you can take screenshots for it, whatever floats your boat with regard to that. But if you're going to use it in any publication, journal, written, or video, I do ask that you reference me and my channel. And if you're going to react to it, I do ask that you ask my permission first because, well, that's just a nice thing to do. Um, if you've got suggestions for other fans for me to take a look at in the future, please leave in the comment section down below. If you've got suggestions on how I can improve my videos, constructive criticism, uh, please leave that in the comment section down below. I do take all that very seriously and try to implement the changes. Just note that it may take a little while for me to implement the changes as I tend to buy a lot of fans at once and then record all at once. And this whole redone series is basically recording all at once and then I'm going to be editing them over a period of time. So implementing changes are going to be a bit difficult for, I guess, the next little while. But I will take it into uh, consideration for the next, essentially the next grouping. Uh, other than that, uh, please join me or hit that subscribe button. It will really help me uh, with YouTube analytics. Uh, if, you can, if you can spare it help me out on Patreon. It will bring it will help me uh, get my channel up to the next level to compete with the bigger channels. None of them are aerospace engineer specialists like I am, so I'm hoping to add a, my own flavor to the internet. If not, I continue doing what I am doing, and um, well, I hope to see you next time here on Computer Tech and More. Have a great day.